Australia is a big country, and its population is pretty spread out, which makes providing that population with the freight it needs quite a logistical challenge. Australia tackles this challenge in a number of ways. Of course, as an island, shipping plays a big role in the movement of cargo. There's also trucking, including Australia's famous road trains, which carry by far the majority of the country's non-bulk freight. A small amount of freight is also transported by air, but then finally there's rail, which is responsible for the movement of about 1.3 billion tonnes of freight annually. In fact, Australia ranks frequently among the top countries in the world by annual freight movements by rail, as we can see here sitting just above Canada to claim the fifth spot. This is partly thanks to Australia being home to the eighth longest rail network in the world, with over 33,000 kilometres of track, which I guess is to almost be expected given the country's immense size. So everything's actually looking kind of good for freight rail in Australia, right? Well, it certainly does well. But when you start digging a little bit deeper into the statistics, things start to unravel. But before we get to that, some of you, although I'm sure not many, might be getting a sense of deja vu. And that's because, to celebrate hitting 10,000 subscribers, I've decided to re-record my first ever explainer video, which was on Australia's freight railways. The original video didn't get a lot of views, and to be fair, the audio quality and video editing were pretty poor, so hopefully that'll be fixed with this version. At the end of the video, I'm also going to be doing a Q&A, so stick around if you're interested in that. But now, back to freight trains. Australia's freight rail movements are heavily dominated by what are called bulk commodities. These are things like coal, iron ore and grain, things you either mine or farm. In fact, the single largest use for freight rail in Australia all sits in just one state, and that is the moving of iron ore from mines in the Pilbara region of Western Australia to the nearby ports, where it can be shipped off to places like China so it can be processed and used in manufacturing. The next most common use cases? transporting coal from coal mines in New South Wales and Queensland to the local ports in those states. But when you look beyond bulk commodities to the freight transport of general goods, the story changes. Trucks carry close to five times the amount of these goods when compared to rail. And on one of Australia's most critical internal trade links, the one between its two largest cities of Sydney and Melbourne, rail now accounts for just 2% of goods freight transport, down drastically from 40% in the 1970s. Now, the use of freight rail to transport bulk commodities is very important. It's both substantially more economical and better for the environment than if we were using trucks to do it instead. But it does begin to highlight one of the first major challenges facing freight rail in Australia. Our geography. Australia is a very big and mostly very dry island, particularly in its centre, which has led to almost all of its population, industry and manufacturing developing on its coastline. You might have seen images like this one on places like Reddit or Twitter showing just how few people live in Australia's vast inland. What this means for rail, however, is that any freight movement is basically just an exercise in moving resources extracted inland to the nearest major coastal city. And because Australia really doesn't do a lot of local manufacturing, these resources are pretty much taken off the trains and dumped onto a ship heading overseas. Now, in some ways, Australia's geography is actually quite good for rail. It's basically the flattest continent, which is nice for trains as they don't like having to go up steep gradients. But our geography also means that if you want to transport goods from one major city to another, and basically every major city is on the coast, sorry Canberra, rail has to compete with shipping. Shipping has overall historically proved to be the cheapest means of transporting goods in a pure cost per ton mile comparison, although it's worth noting this does vary a bit based on factors like distance. And while well, these days, shipping between the various state capitals doesn't represent a particularly large share of domestic freight volumes, it highlights another major problem faced by freight cargo in Australia. Our economy. Australia's economy is dominated by primary industries, things like mining and farming. And as I've mentioned before, once we've extracted the, let's say, iron ore, we don't really process it locally, but instead ship it overseas for that to happen elsewhere. This means we rely heavily on importing goods manufactured elsewhere. And what this means for domestic freight is, there's really just not that much we need to send between cities. We're not going to manufacture a product in Melbourne and then put it on a train to, say, Adelaide. Instead, that product is probably going to be manufactured somewhere like China and then put on a ship to Sydney and Adelaide and Perth, etc, etc. And when it arrives in those cities, it will probably just be put on a truck which will deliver it to its final destination. 
so there's really not that much freight we could send domestically by rail. But this brings me to the next main challenge faced by freight rail in Australia, our history. This siloing of Australia's cities has been happening since these cities were founded, and this has had some large and some pretty dumb implications for Australian rail. When the British colonised Australia, they didn't create one big happy country. Instead, they created a bunch of independent, self-governing colonies. And much like today, at least initially, the economies of these colonies were more focused on international trade than intercolonial trade. With most of their trade at that time being with the United Kingdom rather than each other. This meant there wasn't an extreme need for intercolonial trade links, and what little freight did need to be moved between colonies still had the option of being sent by water. It wasn't until 1883 that the first intercolonial rail link was established between Victoria and New South Wales, and it took a further 34 years before the first and only east-west railway crossing linked Western Australia with the rest of the nation in 1917. Meanwhile in the USA, cross-continental rail travel had been achieved close to 50 years earlier. But because of the ability to send goods from one side of Australia to the other by sea, there wasn't the same kind of urgency to develop cross-continental rail travel. And on top of that, the fact that these colonies were independent and self-governing led to the next big impact of Australia's history on its freight rail transport. And it's a pretty dumb one. The rail networks of the various Australian states were built to different standards, which meant that even when they did build the first intercolonial rail link between Sydney and Melbourne, goods and passengers would need to get off one train at the border and be put onto another to complete the journey. This incompatibility stems from the use of different rail gauges, which, if you don't know, is basically how far the two rails of a train track are apart from each other. The consequences of these different rail gauges have meant that moving freight interstate by rail has been much less efficient and competitive than it should be. Over the years, there's been an effort to bring some degree of standardisation to the country's rail networks, and large sections of the main freight railways between the states have been rebuilt as either standard gauge or dual gauge, which is where a third rail has been added to the railway to make it compatible with trains built for different gauges. And this has definitely improved things. But was it too little too late? Much of Australia's rail networks are still built to different gauges, and what standardisation did happen took a long time. It wasn't until 1995 that all the various mainland state capitals were joined by a unified gauge. Which brings me to the final major issue that has held back freight rail in Australia. Politics. One of the reasons rail standardisation took so long and has been done so half-heartedly has been Australia's politics. As early as 1921, a royal commission urgently recommended the conversion of much of Australia's railways to a single gauge. Despite this, progress has been very, very slow. Politicians have been far more interested in pumping money into road and highway projects, which has led to the efficiency of trucking increasing rapidly, while rail has made barely any progress at all. And you can see this in the stats. In the late 70s, which was already a fair bit after the shift to trucking kicked into high gear, rail was responsible for around 23% of Australia's non-bulk freight rail transport, while trucks accounted for around 65%. Fast forward to today and rail's share has slid to just 17%, while trucking has grown close to 80%. Outside of standardisation, Australia's interstate railways have received very little investment and almost all still follow the same windy, slow and inefficient alignments they followed back when they were first built in the steam age. Meanwhile, most of the windy and narrow roads of the past have been upgraded to wide, straight highways where cars and trucks can make journeys far faster than the equivalent rail route. Reports have suggested that investing in upgrading our key rail lines could see huge improvements to rail transport. Philip Laird from the University of Wollongong suggested that simple upgrades to the existing Sydney to Melbourne rail alignment could cut freight travel times by over two hours, encouraging greater rail mode share along that key route. Overall, while Australia's freight rail system is great at taking bulk commodities from mines and farms to ports, it's still held back from being something more by a mishmash of interconnected factors. From a geography that has meant rail has faced tough competition from shipping, to an economy that doesn't actually produce a lot of goods that need to be transported locally, to a history of incompatibility between state rail networks and a politics that's far more interested in investing in roads than it is in railways. But is there a way for it to be improved? 
Well, there have been some recent projects that point to things improving, if only slowly. In 2018, work finished to convert the Mildura and Murrayville railways to standard gauge. So, rail gauge unification continues to make some progress. Even more impressive is the appropriately titled Inland Rail Project, which aims to open a new 1,700km rail link between Victoria and Queensland, bypassing the congested railways of urban Sydney. The project has been estimated to cost a whopping 31 billion Australian dollars, and is currently expected to be completed in the early 2030s. So we are making some progress, but I'd like to see more. Transporting freight by rail can be substantially safer, more economical and better for the environment than using trucks. And being such a flat and spread out country, Australia is already well suited to make far better use of railways. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. As I mentioned earlier, to celebrate hitting 10,000 subscribers, I put out a call for some Q&A questions you might all have had for me. So if you're interested in that, stick around. Also, for a bit of fun, in the background, I'm going to play some of the very earliest content from this channel from back when I was still doing Cities Skylines videos. I'll start with a question from Alexander Smith 7777 who asks which city I live in. Well, it's not actually a super easy question to answer. Um, I guess I'll just go through basically my history because I've lived in quite a few cities over the course of my life. Um, I was born in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, then my family moved to Perth, as many uh, South African families do when I was a kid. I spent about eight years in Perth before moving to Sydney, where I also spent about eight years. And most recently, I've actually been staying temporarily in London for the last few months using the youth mobility visa, actually. Um, so I am actually kind of interested in doing some London based content. So that might be coming soon. So yeah, I've uh, sort of lived all over the place, Cape Town, Perth, Sydney, and yeah, last few months in London, which has been pretty fun. And it's been a cool opportunity to see like a really world class public transport system in action. Another question from jsabfan2576 asked why my bio says I'm in the UK, and yeah, the fact that I've just been in London the last couple of months is probably why that's the case. It also kind of addresses Nouvelle Cosse's comment about my accent. I think my accent is mostly a South African one, but it sounds a bit weird because I moved to Perth right at the age when your accent stops changing, so now it's a sort of a mix of the two. Up next, we have a question from Raw Power in Motion who asks if I would do a collaboration with Building Beautifully. Well, I definitely really love Building Beautifully's channel. I think he's got some really, really fantastic content. And I actually met up with him for coffee back in March. So that was really nice. He's a really lovely guy. And I would totally be open to collab with him if it made sense for the content. The next question comes from Tim374 and FlumpsJZ7PK who asks where the moose in the name City Moose comes from. Well, I'm, sadly, it's not actually overly interesting. Uh, it's basically the moose just comes from a gamer tag I've been using since I was a teen, which I'm pretty sure was randomly generated, so with something that just ends in the word moose. So I've just kind of stuck with that, and I've never actually seen a moose in the wild or anything like that, unfortunately. And then the word city in the name just comes from the fact that I make videos mainly about cities. The next question comes in from the random idiot on the internet who asks what my favourite recent railway project in Australia is. Um, well, this is a pretty tough one. I'm, I'm very much a big fan of Perth's Metronet. I think it's kind of slid under the radar a bit as far as Australian public transportation projects are concerned, but uh, it's actually adding quite a lot to Perth's railway network, so I really like that. Um, that said, I think my overall favourite is probably Sydney Metro. It's by far the most modern public transport system in Australia, and I mean, haven't been on the driverless trains, they're just really, really cool. Uh, plus, when you add in like Metro West and Metro West and Sydney Airport, it's really quite an enormous project. I mean, it's pretty transformative for Sydney. So, yeah, probably Sydney Metro, but Perth's Metronet is definitely up there as well. And uh, following on from that, 8th Robin asks what I think Perth should do after Metronet. And uh, BDub2024 asks a whole lot of Metronet-based uh, questions, so I can give my a few of my opinions on that. Um, don't worry, I will eventually get around to doing a video on Metronet. Um, it's just such a very big project with so many, lots of different elements that there's really quite a lot to talk about. What I'd like to see done after Metronet, however, is probably an extension of the Fremantle line. It just seems like a really easy, quick win kind of project, considering the railway corridor is already there and there is has been quite a lot of growth in Perth's southern suburbs recently. Um, plus, as BDub mentions, there is a potential to connect it up the Fremantle line with the Mandurah line for an interchange, which I think that could be pretty cool. 
Up next, Nathan T. Kelly asks why I've chosen to impersonate Oswald Mosley. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna lie, I did actually have to Google who that was, and I'm not sure I like the comparison. Uh, I think the comment is probably mostly about my moustache, though, uh, which people have commented on before, but I'm gonna stay strong and stick with it. And sticking with the slightly less serious questions, Kusi Seal, not sure I pronounced that right, asks if I'm AI generated. Which, again, a surprising number of people seem to ask. Um, well, I can assure you that, at least to the best of my knowledge, I am a real person. Alright, so the next question comes in from Jeremy Sheehan6051, who asks what my favourite Sydney train line and station are. Um, I think the station's pretty easy for me. I really, really like museum. It has some great historical architecture, and the finishes just make you feel like you're riding a metro somewhere in Europe. I don't know, really cool station, really great architecture. Uh, train line is a bit harder. I'd probably say the T4 though. It has the benefit of being the most reliable line, um, but I mainly like it because they've got the Tangara train sets, which I think are really, really fun to ride. Um, there's also the 70s and 80s architecture on the Eastern Suburbs line stations, which I think look really cool, like they're really bold, which is rather fun. And then back to the less serious questions, OMG Ski asks, uh, City of Moose only fans when? Um, well, sorry to disappoint, but I don't think I'm going to do that anytime soon, but I will sort of take that as a compliment. And then the next question comes in from uh, Giblet Gravy, who asks why my videos on major infrastructure projects can often come off like I'm being a bit negative about them. Well, I actually, I think this is a fair critique, and I do sometimes wonder if I'm coming across more negative than I mean to be. As a general rule, I'm almost always happy to see the project I'm talking about happen. Like, I'm super excited by the Metro Tunnel, by Sydney Metro, by the Suburban Rail Link. All of them, I think, uh, will be great additions to their city's public transport networks. But I guess it's because I think these projects are so important that I want them done as best as they possibly can be. So, hence my critiques. And, I mean, you sort of mentioned something about, like, business cases and sometimes these decisions that I'm criticizing are, um, you know, justified in the business case. But what I will say is that, um, in my view, just because something is mentioned in the business case doesn't make it 100% correct. And I think we still have the right to question it. Like, if we just look at the City Loop, which was built in the back in the 70s in Melbourne, I'm sure the business case justified a lot of the decisions that made that were made during that project that, in hindsight, weren't actually super great. And now we're spending billions of dollars on things like the Metro Tunnel and potentially the City Loop reconfiguration to fix these problems. So, I guess just in the end, I don't think I've done a video on any project that I actually properly dislike. I basically like all of them, maybe with the exception of the Hyperloop. I just think... Um, because these projects are so important, they need to be critiqued. Our next question comes in from Akil Karan Dikia 99 who asks if I think high-speed rail could be viable in Australia. Uh, well, I think it could be quite viable, especially between, you know, major cities like Sydney and Melbourne, if we're talking about it purely from a usage perspective. Like, I think if you built a, uh, a high-speed rail between Sydney and Melbourne, it would get a lot of people using it. I don't think it would actually be profitable to, profitable to run, but I think, like any public good, it shouldn't have to be. Um, that said, do I think it will get built? Uh, not anytime soon. I just don't think Australia has the political willpower to take on such an expensive project, sadly. Uh, then the next question comes in from Angus Beef 9200 who asks what I think of the Brisbane Metro. Uh, well, I definitely want to cover this topic properly in its own video, but in short, it's not a metro, uh, and they probably shouldn't call it that. It's more of a bus rapid transit system, which is perfectly fine. Bus rapid transit is a very valid uh, form of public transportation, uh, but a metro, it's not. So they should just call it what it is, in my view. And the final question comes in from sjam2711, who asks me to tell more about myself. Um, well, I already mentioned where I live and where I'm from. As for my job, uh, my day job, I work in UX design, which uh, is sort of where my skills are making those nice little map animations I often use in my videos come from. And as for what got me into making this sort of content, uh, well, my interest in public transport and urbanism basically started when I moved from Perth to Sydney. I lived in a very sprawling, car-dependent suburb in Perth, and then I moved to the inner west in Sydney, which is, you know, was built before cars, so it's 
uh, very walkable, um, lots of things to do, like easy, easy walking distance from your house and lots of actually pretty good public transport. And I guess just seeing the difference um, that can make about suburbs being walkable and having good public transport in terms of how much, you know, in my view at least, better the lifestyle it offers is really got me interested and actually quite passionate about urbanism and public transport infrastructure. But that brings me to the end of the Q&A and the end of the video. If you've enjoyed it, consider giving it a like and subscribing if you haven't already. And as always, I'm City Moose. Thanks for watching.